ようなことをどっかで書いていたように記憶しますが、うん、今現代の詩は病気にしろあるいは交通事故にしろ、えー、何らのドラマがない、えー、英雄的な詩というものもない時代に我々生きております、えー、それにつけて思い出しますのは Yukio Mishima A Japanese author, playwright, and nationalist held a profound influence on Japanese culture as one of the most renowned novelists of the 20th century, with a legacy that continues to shape discussions in literature and philosophy to this day. His writings often discuss the duality of life and death, elegance and brutality, modernity and tradition, and what this video will focus on the mind and the body. In his book Sun and Steel, Mishima discusses the harmony between the physical and the spiritual, the truth and reality. His relationship with exercise and individuality. I'd like to share and critique some of Mishima's ideas as they are quite profound and worth recognition. If you haven't read the book, don't worry, I'll provide lots of quotes and context to hopefully make Mishima's perspective and my own clear. At the beginning of his book, Mishima describes his relationship with words, stating, In my case, words came first of all, then, belatedly, with every appearance of extreme reluctance and already clothed in concepts, came the flesh. It was already, as goes without saying, sadly wasted by words. Mishima expresses disdain for the corrosive nature of words, specifically their tendency to reduce reality to an abstraction, undermining the beauty and complexity of real world experiences. It is reaffirmed throughout Sun and Steel that our reliance on words and neglect of our corporeal existence can distort or fail to capture the richness of life. He later discusses our indulgence in nocturnal thought. Which he too indulged in as expressed in a poem he wrote at 15. And still the light pours down. Men laud the day. I shun the sun and cast my soul into the shadowy pit. Mishima's hostility towards the sun in his childhood was his only rebellion against the spirit of the age. He reverently looked at the past in a highly conservative and traditionalist way, likely due to his samurai ancestry, which he was deeply proud of. This rebellion may have encapsulated a broader rejection of societal norms as Japan shifted away from traditional practices. Nocturnal thought basically represents the time we spend in the small hours of the night, in our study, our pit, where we allow our minds to venture into the abstract, which then dominates our literature and works put before the public. He wrote The men who indulged in nocturnal thought, it seemed to me, had without exception dry, lusterless skins and sagging stomachs. They sought to wrap up a whole epic in a capacious night of ideas, and rejected in all its forms the sun that I had seen. Mishima is essentially claiming that it is improbable that one, whose appearance is far from the classical idea, could accurately summarize reality simply through the language of words without consideration for the language of the body. The sun, I believe, is symbolic in a way. The feeling of the sun glazing our eyes and coating our skin is inexplicable. Yes, we can attempt to do it justice in a dull way with words, but we will fall short of capturing its glory. His attraction to the sun seemed to be more so an attraction to our physical existence, or a belated appreciation of it. He stated, The need for me to train my body could have been foreseen from that moment when I first felt the attraction of the surface profundities. I was aware that the only thing that could justify such an idea was muscle. Who pays any attention to a physical education theorist grown decrepit? One might accept the pallid scholar's toying with nocturnal thoughts in the privacy of his study, but what could seem more meager, more chilly than his lips were they to speak, whether in praise or in blame, of the body? So well acquainted was I with poverty of that type that one day, quite suddenly it occurred to me to acquire ample muscles of my own. This realization, and many others expressed in Sun and Steel, led Mishima down a path of exercise, writing, The steel faithfully taught me the correspondence between the spirit and the body. Thus, feeble emotions, it seemed to me, corresponded to flaccid muscles, sentimentality to a sagging stomach, and over impressionability to an oversensitive white skin. Bulging muscles, a taut stomach, and a tough skin, I reasoned, would correspond respectively to an intrepid fighting spirit, the power of dispassionate intellectual judgment, and robust disposition. This means that one's body should be a physical representation of one's spirit and ideals. For example, if someone calls themselves courageous, their physique should reflect that, as maintaining a healthy body requires self control, commitment, and resilience, all of which are characteristics of a courageous person. Mishima quickly makes clear that even a coward can have an impressive physical stature, and a brave person may not. 
However, he thinks these attributes should complement one another. Are emblems of moral character summed up by words like intrepidity, dispassionateness, robustness, and more need to manifest themselves in our outward appearance? At least, Mishima believed he ought to gain the physical characteristics that aligned with his ideals. His overarching idea is that neither the mind nor body should take precedent over the other. We should cultivate both equally since both have a purpose. In the body, there is an unspoken truth and a certain reality. In words, we can communicate, but the truths we attempt to convey can be abstractions and falsehoods. Mishima also affirms that these profound insights gained by partaking in physical activity can help us better understand ourselves and the world around us. I want to offer a more modern perspective on the topic, and also, since Mishima does favor reality over thoughts and words, I'd like to ask two questions. One, is understanding ourselves and the world around us through the physical the best means of doing so? And two, when shall we doubt our minds and senses when faced with reality? I'd first like to address what I do agree on in Sun and Steel. Words cannot capture the complexity of human experiences. This is true. David Hume offers a similar thought in an inquiry concerning human understanding, stating, These faculties, meaning memories and imagination, may mimic or copy the perceptions of the senses, but they can never entirely reach the force and vivacity of the original sentiment, meaning the lived experience. Mishima and Hume are correct in these notions to the extent of it being, to me, incorrigible. However, I would like to contest Mishima's idea that vigorous exercise is an appropriate way to gain a better perspective on the world around us and ourselves. The function of physical activity in its barest form is meant to improve your physical and mental health through increasing your muscular strength and endurance or secreting hormones. Although the reason people exercise can be much more nuanced than this simple definition. Some people do it to improve their physique. Some people do it to impress others. Some people do it just out of enjoyment. But I can assure you, there is a very few number of people who are doing it in hopes of seeking some deeper meaning in their life. The function of exercise has transitioned hugely away from the types of activity Mishima was doing, like kendo, which is Japanese fencing, weightlifting, and martial arts. Mishima's goal was to gain a sense of bodily knowledge and attain the ideal appearance that would be synonymous with his pre-existing ideals. For Mishima, words came before the flesh. His ideals, his morals, were already refined. He had spent his time thinking in his dusky room, his pit. The critique I have is not so much of Mishima, but of our current times. Far too many people haven't refined their mind or body. Mishima's introspective skills allowed him to have such profound insights from physical activity. His thoughts gave purpose to his actions. Language undoubtedly is insufficient when it comes to conveying reality, but our ideas are often the things that shape reality. To understand anything, we need clear conceptions to guide our views of ourselves and the world around us. In my experience, albeit bias, voluntary vigorous exercise only gave me more questions about the world rather than answers. Why do I exert myself? What is the purpose of my actions? Who am I and where do I belong in the world? These almost unanswerable questions forced me to seek out more knowledge. If I limit myself to the perceptions that I gain only from working out, how do I account for my lack of nuance? The only way we can gain such a broad perspective of knowledge on any given topic is by expanding our horizon of thought and leaving our bubble, or as Mishima would call it, his pit. But not to necessarily have an experience that shows us the truth of reality, but to open us up to the ideals of others. There is such an enormous discrepancy between Mishima's time and our own. I believe many of us have very little strength in our convictions. People, if they even have unique, well thought out, logical ideas, which is rare, will not even fight for them. We conform, we obey, we adhere to societal norms, we live monotonous lives and think bland thoughts. Now, more than ever, should we try refining our minds. Our observations precede our ideas, and our ideas precede our actions. 
To view the world rationally, we have to gain more knowledge. In North America, or the West, a lot of people look at education with disdain or consider it to be a nuisance. Gaining more knowledge for most is limited only to their time in school. This is unfortunate because school, up until about university, they only teach you very rudimentary yet important things that don't really help you create ideals or a well-rounded moral compass. And this will end up shaping how you understand and view the world. If you have taken the time to learn, maintaining your biological health would probably be important to you because it's the only thing that will keep you functioning. I only counter Mishima because I believe if we change the way we think or change the way we approach thinking, it will inadvertently have a massive cultural impact that will end up altering our day to day. If we care about knowledge and value the information shared with us, we should put it into practice and that will change how we look at the world. This is all very idealistic, but we have to start somewhere. Everything starts with an idea. The ills of the world will likely be solved with an idea. And we, as individuals, can benefit from appreciating those ideas and implementing them into our lives. Where the mind goes, the body will follow. So, let's focus on growing our brain because it will affect how we view everything that surrounds us. But how do we view the world around us? Another point I'd like to make in opposition to Mishima is that in the physical, he discusses this certain truth. I agree with this point, but that certain truth can be vastly different from one individual to another, which can hugely distort any sort of certain reality. Our emotions and unique circumstances are often what sway this view. This will once again be a point that advocates for putting precedence on the mind before the body. In Sun and Steel, Mishima describes how even his perception of the sun changed over time, stating, It gleams so encouragingly on the wings of planes leaving missions, on the force of bayonets, on the badges of military caps, on the embroidery of military banners, but still, far more, it was the way it glistened on the blood flowing ceaselessly from the flesh and on the silver bodies of flies clustering on wounds. Mishima once associated the sun with pervasive corruption and destruction, linking the sun with darker imagery. It doesn't matter if his description is right or wrong because it's his. Something beautiful about humans is that we all look at things quite differently. Although this can cause disagreements between people, dependent on what they consider to be good or bad, elegant or brutal, right or wrong, it adds diversity to our collective thought. If we allow our individual views of the world around us and our experiences to be the dogma that guides our morals, then we are effectively shutting down our mind. As a society, when we eliminate the ability to look beyond our subjective truths, we eliminate our ability to think critically. Our realities, our truths, are valuable, yet they are biased. If we can expand the way we think, we'll be able to expand the way we perceive things. With more knowledge to utilize, we may look at situations less emotionally and more analytically. We should have subjective and unique experiences, but we should have the ability to evaluate them with objectivity. Mishima acknowledges a point similar to this, writing, The body and the mind create their own small universe, their own false order, calling it an inevitable tendency. He thought we should redirect this false order in a direction that better accorded with our aims, which goes back to the mind. The mind and body should live in harmony, but everything begins with thoughts. We can use our conceptions as a directive force for our actions, a force that should be guided by logic and reason. Developing those skills first starts with the brain. To make sense of reality and our inexplicable experiences, we need a foundation of morals and ideals to support us. But I may be biased. Unlike Mishima, my body came first in my life. I played sports, I exercised, I disliked reading, I had very little passion to gain knowledge until I turned about 15. But Mishima may also be biased. His experience is contrary to mine. And that's okay. That's good. To solidify my overarching point, how did Mishima write his book? 
how did I make this video? How have you evaluated this information? It all starts with your mind. What you decide to do with this newly processed information will then actualize itself in the physical. Everything starts with a vision, an idea, a thought. So let's all start cultivating that wrinkly organ between our ears. Thanks for watching. Wow, hello to everyone who made it this far. That was quite the video. I apologize for the very lengthy section at the beginning where I just covered Mishima's book and ideas, but I didn't want to misrepresent him. The book is about 50 pages and it was a pretty interesting read. I didn't cover all his ideas as my main focus surrounded his views on the mind and body. If you are fascinated with some of the quotes I added to this video, all of it was in Sun and Steel, which I'll have linked below, as well as any other sources I looked at in the process of writing my script. If you are super familiar with Mishima's work and you believe I got something severely wrong, please let me know. I am human and make mistakes, but my primary focus was on the points I discussed at the start. And lastly, I actually want to thank the Instagram follower who asked if I could share my thoughts on this topic. So thank you, you are awesome. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed hearing my thoughts. Comment down below what you think and have a good day.